Welcome to the place where we learn about and learn from the leaders in our field who are powering human creativity. I am Aaron Dworkin, and this is Arts Engines. <laughs> Thanks again for joining me here on Arts Engines. Today's guest is Blake Anthony Johnson, who serves as president and CEO of the renowned Chicago Sinfonietta. Blake Anthony, or as we love to say, BA, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aaron. It's so nice to be back here again. Thank you for the invitation. Absolutely. And so like last time, of course, I have been am so excited to when we have you on the show. Um, I get the benefit of having seen so much of your work uh, over the years and um, and your history with Sphinx, including with Sphinx Lead. And um, and of course, now at the helm uh, of Chicago Sinfonietta uh, and truly, uh, you know, I think one of the standout orchestras in our in our nation and especially its history and legacy relating to diversity. Um, um, so kind of just along those lines, first, I thought I'd just start off really quick if you could just share any of our guests who kind of aren't familiar with this unique role that uh, Sinfonietta plays. Can you kind of just give them that quick background on the orchestra itself? Absolutely. So Chicago Sinfonietta was founded in 1987 by Maestro Paul Freeman. He really wanted to create an orchestra that resembled the city in which it resided. And so his career was as a prolific conductor, both in Canada and Europe, and he did a lot of amazing recordings. So things like the African-American Heritage Series and a bunch more that you can find on our record label, Sadie Records. But essentially, Chicago Sinfonietta's mission is championing equity, diversity, and inclusion by creating community through both symphonic experiences. So that translates to many different things, multimedia productions, to our fellowship, to our education services, to our community and public programming. And then of course, being kind of a motto and proof of concept for EDI concepts and initiatives that we want adopted by the field at large. Awesome, awesome, absolutely. And it really does play this uh, just incredibly unique role. And um, and at the helm, uh, you know, you've really been just continuing that extraordinary impact that the organization has. Um, so, you know, uh, there are a couple of things that are kind of going on in the field. And I thought maybe we could touch on them. I thought your viewpoints on this, the work that you're doing could really be important. Um, and the first I wanted to kind of tackle was, just this role, especially you know, with all of the increased visibility and focus on EDI and 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 uh, and all things related to diversity and inclusion over the past several years, orchestras, arts organizations are thinking about their human capital um, and resources. Um, but a lot of arts organizations don't have formal HR departments and or the way in which they focus on some of these things. They think, oh, we'll do this for EDI. We'll hire someone who, who is of color to kind of do things or, you know, to, so we think we're, we're doing something. And then others, of course, really do very thoughtful systemic work. And just wondering if you could kind of speak to this role that you think really overarching HR has relating to EDI and this work? Thank you for that question. As everyone knows, because our institutions work with unions, we spend a lot of time talking about unions. So Chicago Sinfonietta, for instance, just passed a four-year collective bargaining agreement and a few other union agreements that we needed in place to capture all this momentum. But we do not, we as in the field of classical music, do not spend a lot of time on how are we looking at retention and best ways of inclusion and belonging among staff. So there's a lot of effort and I think funds about having different faces or voices at the table, but it's really interesting. There's no systems in place to make sure that they're captured in real time and then also instituted in a way that doesn't just have to go through a senior placement on the organizational chart or the CEO. And so Symphonietta, and of course, do 
my role as an officer for the League of American Orchestras is to really share this process of what it looks like to have a comprehensive human resource department, which unfortunately is not the norm in our field. And so when people say, why are we not aggressively looking for the talent that we want? I'm saying, well, that's great, even if we do that, but what exactly do we have in place once they get here to address the ideas that we lose a lot of folks once we get them in the door. And so even with Sinfonietta, as everyone knows, we do a lot of third party consultations to see what can we do, not that just makes our organization stronger, but other orchestras. And so our next step has been to onboard our HR department, which started this month. So it's been really great. We already have what we call a, a art committee, uh, Authority Training Committee, also known as Anti-Racism Committee. I use the ART acronym for many, many things, but we have kind of some of these board structures and organization structures to push EDI initiatives, but the human resources in terms of, but what about staff? I think it's really important because they actually push a lot of things that happen with the institution long-term. Absolutely. And so for any out, you know, out there in our audience who may be at an orchestra or other arts institution that doesn't really have a formalized HR system and either may be thinking, we don't really need that or that kind of thing, or they're hearing what you're sharing and they're saying, you know what, we, it will, you know, we'd really like to begin to explore this. Are there, where would you point them if they were asking you, you know, how can we best get started? Is there some resources in the field to help kind of guide us for this process? I'll put on my LAO hat for a second. I would say it's coming soon. I think that is one of my main priorities and my work with the league is that we make those resources more available for orchestras and members who really wanna go on that path. From a more personal standpoint, I would say just shoot me an email. We, even here in Chicago, there are other arts institutions that are really curious, like what is your maternity leave? Or how do you do that for paternal leave? You know, given that not our caregivers are one particular gender. So I'm actually more than welcome to share that information because I think it's such a critical part of transforming what these institutions look like in the sense that yes get them in the door but how do we really make it a home for everyone awesome awesome and it's so important and you know it's even was a driving force behind the you know founding of this show was how important the administrative practices are in our field so that we can make the artistry and the creativity a sustainable reality. So really so such important work. Um, so switching gears just a little bit, um, I know we're already beginning to run a little short on time, but again, in the arts, there's a lot of people who are like, we just do, we, we, we produce our art, we create it, we put it on a stage, our audiences experience it. Um, but then especially there's others who are looking kind of further and saying, how does our art impact community? Or for example, does our art or do we have a role impacting uh, economic development in our community or housing um, in our community? Do you have any thoughts about that on what the role of arts organizations should be as it relates to things even beyond our art? So I'm gonna put on, I'm gonna put on my city council hat for DK, so that's the Department of Cultural Affairs, which is one of my day jobs here for the city of Chicago. But I have really strong opinions about this in the sense that if we really believe in the power of music, if we really believe that it's one of the most universal languages, why would we not use that and leverage it to problem solve social determinants of health? So how can you use music to help with education access and quality? Or how can we use performances or public programming to help with healthcare quality or neighborhood environment in terms of making connections amongst different generations or different social economic statuses? Or how can we make social and community bonds stronger by giving them spaces in which they can naturally kind of build it on their own. And then of course, economic stability. How does an orchestra that has so many tentacles and so many relationships outside of our sector, how can we use that to say, hey, did you know about this? Or hey, did you know about this community organizer who's trying to move at jobs here? Or you know, did you know about this food truck festival that actually could maybe go to a food desert? I mean, there are a million things that can come up. So I think for me, yes, we play amazing concerts on stage and I 
we will always focus on commissions. We will always focus on putting women and BIPOC composers and conductors, not here just in Chicago, but elsewhere, but also like how can you be really a public service and a public servant and with the community in that you're in. So not just city community, but regional and national. And so how it's played out here for Chicago Sinfonietta is actually letting the staff and musicians drive some of these initiatives. So we call them CHAI projects, Ch Chicago Sinfonietta Health Initiatives. And they're specific music programs and projects that tackle social determinants of health in the way that they most see fit. So we actually work with our local union here as well that put up dollars and time to say, you know, the artist, no, you know, I'm a runner. So I'm always showing these people as a jogger, you know, the city in a way that most people just don't because, you know, nooks and crannies that some people just kind of overlook because it's on your route. And same thing for artists. Artists have these amazing lens of the community that most people will never know. And so some of that onus or some of the kind of ownership of what's driving some of our more community-led initiatives are actually with the musicians and fellows. It is truly, truly extraordinary work. And thanks so much for sharing that. And especially not just the kind of perspective that, that you have on it, but also kind of how you're actually putting that into practice with Sinfonietta. Uh, really amazing work. Uh, unfortunately, we are just about out of time, but as you know, I always like to ask, you know, there's gotta be some challenging times as a leader, lots of leaders or people in positions where, um, you know, there might be some tough times. I can only imagine sometimes working with city government entities can uh, not always be the smoothest process. So in the toughest of times, where do you draw upon for either strength or inspiration or, you know, to help overcome during the tough times? Yes. And as you know, part of my job is the fun and maybe not so fun parts is going to other institutions in which they might have issues. And one of the issues that's kind of come up quite a bit is burnout. So kind of going back to your question of burnout for the old timers who we've not had our normal ebb and flow in a season because it's just been every single week, every single month, we're trying to just stay up to date with the pandemic. And then also burnout for people who are new to these institutions since the kind of first onslaught of, of furloughs and closings, because every day, these institutions are getting one step closer to what they used to be or what the new version of the institution is going to be in this new world. And so what I'm kind of holding my self to in terms of keeping motivated is just remembering why I got into administration in the first place or just art in itself, this access, access to people that you might not otherwise ever know. And then of course, access to yourself. There's so many things to the arts that you just, you know, just simple things. When we play music at the top of our board meetings, it's really interesting because it gets them three or four minutes to just think and put the, place themselves mentally somewhere else. And so I have actually been driven lately since the last time we talked more by just people's willingness and openness to see what maybe has not been happening or maybe did not exist before, but is possible now because everything's new and there are, you know, whatever rule book people had, you can throw that rule book out. And so I think kind of focusing on this creation and innovation and using the arts to also, of course, encourage that in other parts of people's lives is really inspiring for me, but also what's kind of pushing me along. Wow. Well, Blake Anthony Johnson, you truly are one of the arts engines who is powering human creativity in our world. Thank you so much for joining us again on the show. Thank you, pleasure. Thank you.